going to be leading us through the conversation today. Um, you may have noted as you join, uh, we have the default to be uh, microphones muted and, uh, and cameras turned off. Um, and, uh, and so uh, just, just know that uh, that's the expectation for today. Um, we are going to go through the webinar and we're going to get started real soon. As we go, uh, we do encourage everyone to ask questions. And uh, as you have them, we ask that you put those in the chat. Uh, the rest of our team will be monitoring there as we go. And we do plan to save some time at the end uh, to answer some of those questions um, uh, that have come up throughout the webinar. Last but not least, uh, the webinar is being recorded and we are going to distribute this after the session. Um, so if anyone's scrambling to take notes um, or if you have things uh, or you want to share this with colleagues later, just know that that link is going to be available to you uh, when we send that follow up email. So just getting started from here, um, this is our webinar on how to use search data to improve your communication strategy, communications and outreach. Um, before we get started, uh, a couple comments. So first things first, we are Parsons TKL. So we are a consultancy, consultancy that has pioneered an approach we call engagement architecture. What engagement architecture means is the, the idea that your organization is a interconnected system of people, platforms, and processes that drive audience engagement, drive impact. And so we look at all of those pieces across departments and we see how they work together to accomplish these goals, accomplish organizational missions. Uh, and so that's a, a little bit of background about who we are and the type of work that we do. Of course, as the head of the data team, we focus a lot on how data moves throughout these systems and how they can be used both to improve your capabilities from a technology and product standpoint, but also from a process and team standpoint. How does data help empower your staff to do their work uh, more effectively? So that's a little bit of background about us. Um, so a little bit about us, I think in a couple moments you should see a poll pop up. Um, I would like to just get a little bit of sense about uh, who's joining today um, and what roles uh, you, you play on the team and, and recognizing that in, uh, in the mission driven sector, sometimes that's many hats. Um, so we'll just take a couple minutes uh, for you guys to, to fill out this poll here. And one of the big reasons why I want to have this information is data in general, and I think search data and in particular can do a lot of things. Every one data point can be used in many different ways. Uh, and so knowing a little bit about what your role is can change what's possible with the data that you have. Um, so these are the, the, the types of ideas and insights that we're gonna wanna bring into the discussion today. Um, but then also I want you guys to have in mind as you go back into your work and think about how you wanna use search data uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. All right. So I think everyone uh, should see the results. Um, it does look like we've got predominantly communications, uh, but really not exclusively. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, an interesting uh, correlation between communications and marketing. Um, those are roles that uh, overlap uh, a lot, especially in this sector. Um, and, uh, and then also some program, public relations, executive leadership. Okay. All right. This is all really helpful. Um, so we're going to keep going here. Um, so let's talk about search data. What is search data and why should we be focusing on it? Um, you know, first things first, uh, you know, for anyone who is just getting started, has, you know, heard of, maybe looked at, but doesn't make search data a daily part or a weekly uh, or any kind of regular part of your work. Um, we have seen consistently uh, that search data is one of the most underutilized resources. It's something that every organization has access to, whether they know it or not, um, but we rarely see it being used as a part of sort of a, a standard kit of analytics. Um, and so that's one of the big reasons why we wanna focus on it. Um, uh, in this webinar, we're gonna talk about what it is, we're gonna talk about where to find it, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the specific tools and the places where you'll find it in your organization. So specifically, Google Search Console, um, uh, on-site search data, and a couple uh, ways and some of the most common. Uh, but then other places where you can get search and search-like data, uh, including publicly uh, things like Google Trends. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit as well about social media, sort of a, an, an honorable mention there. 
Um, so search data is particularly valuable when you are trying to understand your audiences, you're trying to understand their interests. Um, search is where people express their interests in their own words uh, in a way that they often don't elsewhere. Um, so you think about Google search, people are typing in, you know, as they would phrase it, the things that they want and they expect the magic of Google to return it to them. Once they actually get to your website, uh, a lot of you will have your on-site search uh, configured. And so with that site search, you can then also type in exactly what you're looking for. Um, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but there's a, a key difference here. In Google search, people are looking for what they want and then ideally they find it. Uh, on your website, uh, people often use site search when they want to find something, but they can't, and so then they search for it. Um, so, you know, similar experience in terms of what the user is typing in, but they have very different implications for you, for your user experience, and the types of insights you can draw from them. Uh, so I mentioned, and we'll talk again about uh, social media, um, but that is another place where people go and where they are typing things uh, and, and directly sharing ideas from their head. Um, so it's another place where you can look at the text that they enter and learn about your audience from that. And then last but not least, uh, you know, we're focusing on search data today, um, but this is just one part of all the different types of data that you can collect. Um, and so there's lots of other types of interactions with your site, whether that's just simple page views uh, or things like downloads or scrolling on your website. Um, all of those are other things that you can use to gauge and evaluate interests. Um, uh, but it, rarely with those are you getting as direct uh, a sort of a human language input about what people are wanting. So we like to correlate these with uh, search data, um, but uh, it serves a different purpose. Um, so just to you know, go by analogy in a couple ways, um, thinking about what search data represents. So you could imagine that you own a storefront. Um, you know, you've got your rows, you've got your, uh, you know, your food, your drinks, um, all of that would be the content on your website. Um, if you were sitting there at the front of your store and people came in, they would turn to you and they would say, hey, where's the toilet paper? Where's the milk? Where are the things that I want and that I need? Um, and, and as you were hearing that, you would start to notice the patterns. You would start to get a sense for what people typically want and how you might change the layout of your store to serve those needs. That same thing is happening online. You are getting those same types of quick, I want this, I want that. And a lot of that information is hiding in your search data. Um, so where it might be more obvious and intuitive how to do it and what you should, how you should respond in person, um, you have to do a little bit of digging in your data to get that same benefit from your, your online uh, uh, search data. So one of the things that we hear often, um, uh, a little bit sometimes with Google search, but especially with site search, is people say, ah, oh, yeah, but it's just, it's such a small volume of my data. Um, you know, Google search typically runs in the realm of 30 to as much as 70% of a website's traffic. But site search, you know, a lot of people are only seeing site search, site search being one to 3% of their traffic, which may sound small. Uh, but the first thing to remember is that these are people who are motivated to find your stuff. Um, that's somewhat true with Google search. It's definitely true with your site search. The fact that they haven't already given up and that they're actually you know, going into uh, that extra field to, to look for things that they want means that they really want it. So those are important people to listen to. Um, but even just thinking about the numbers, uh, you know, here we've got approximations. Let's say your site has a million page views in a year. Um, just based on the, the lower edge of these estimates, that means 300,000 people have typed something in to Google search in order to find your content. And, uh, and, and, and all of that is, is, is saved data. And so those are all questions that people ask that you can look at. Even site search at 1% of your million page views uh, or a million visitors is gonna be 10,000 people um, who used your site search. Compare that to things like focus groups, uh, uh, running surveys where you might have on the order of hundreds or maybe thousands of people. Um, this is you know, a slightly different type of feedback you're gonna get, but it's orders of magnitude more people that you could be learning from by using your site search and Google search data. 
Uh, and then last but not least, as uh, you know, to close out the prelude, uh, there's a good question of, of why now? Uh, why is now a good time to look at, think about, and use your site search data? Um, one of uh, the analysts on our team um, has a, you know, experience as a trail builder, uh, and uh, he brought to us a saying from the trail building community that the best time to build a trail is in the rain. Uh, it may sound terrible, you know, it's unpleasant out there, it's muddy, you know, things are, are uh, you know, washing away, but that's exactly where you get to see the weak points in your trail, that where the erosion is, is wiping away the trail, where you need to uh, reinforce things. And, and I think with a lot of what's going on in the world right now, um, nonprofit organizations are experiencing that. They are experiencing erosion. We are all having a rainy day right now. Um, and uh, and I, I think, you know, in some cases where you've got a lot of traffic, this is your first time to get a sense of who these people are, understand what their needs. Even if you have your existing audience, you know, your, your core constituents who are coming to you, um, their lives have changed, their needs have changed. So you might need to readjust what you think you know about them. And your search data is a place that you can look for that. Um, so it is, you know, with, with everything that's going on right now, we really encourage people to be looking at their data and search data in particular is a, is a great way to understand your audiences. So I'm gonna jump forward and we're going to start talking about tools in particular. Um, but as we begin, I wanna put up one more poll and, uh, and just get a sense of uh, overall in, in the, the audience here, how much experience we have with and, and how much access we have uh, to these types of data in your organization. So we've got two questions up right now uh, about what you do or don't have um, uh, access to in terms of data. Uh, and I'll, I'll use the feedback from this to uh, help guide a little bit um, how deep I go into, into talking about some of uh, the different tools. Um, but I think also it's just going to be useful to, to get a sense of how much work there might be afterwards, after this webinar, uh, for, for this group um, uh, in order to start taking advantage of their search data. So we'll just uh, take a, a minute or so uh, to get that input from everyone. Okay, all right, it looks like we've got uh, pretty consistent access to Google Analytics data directly. Uh, and also about half of folks have access to Google Search Console. Uh, but I think there's, uh, it's also going to be worth uh, spending some time talking about that platform, what it is. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have also seen access does not mean awareness. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of extra time on that platform in particular, um, talking about what it is and, uh, and what we can start getting from it once we get access. All right, so your tools, what's available today uh, for, for getting uh, search data and search insights? Um, so first things first, Google Search Console. Google Search Console is Google's gift to the world. Um, they have become the, the first stop um, for seeking information for much of the human race. Um, and, uh, and so they have a tremendous amount of information about what people want, what they need. And Google Search Console is a platform that they have created that they make available to anyone who owns a website um, so that they can see what are people looking for that, has, that, that leads them to you. Um, so in Google Search Console, uh, well, first of all, let me talk about um, uh, getting your Google Search Console. Um, this is Google's own dashboard. It's something that they, data they have, and it's a system that they manage. Um, so it's not actually that you need to somehow get it or install it. What you have to do is claim it. Um, you are proving to Google that you are the person who owns your website, um, that you are a person who should have access to this data. Um, and uh, there are a few different ways to do that. Sometimes just having your Google Analytics access is enough to get in. Other times you are going to need to actually put you know, little bits of code on the website to prove to Google that you deserve to have access. Um, so this is something that you may and likely will need to work with your technology team in order to claim access. Once you are in there, um, 
Google, Anal uh, Google Search Console uh, gives you a lot of deep information. And so we've got uh, a couple screenshots here that give you a sense of what's in there. Um, so they're gonna give you the direct queries, um, you know, things that people have typed in uh, that, that resulted in, uh, in your content uh, getting featured in one way or another. It also shows you the specific pages um, um, that people are finding when they search for, uh, for things related to your content. Uh, you can also look at uh, countries or sort of by geography, where are people coming from? There's information about devices, um, how your, your content appears in search appearance, um, uh, and, and more. Uh, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of other edges to that platform. We could spend a whole webinar just talking about it. Um, I think another important distinction here is Google Search Console tells you about the people who found you and came to your website um, and, uh, and actually showed up there. But it also is going to tell you about people who searched for things, saw your website and the results, but did not come. And so I think that's something that often gets lost. Uh, you know, you can see here for this website, again, orders of magnitude, more people searched for things that Google thought was related to your website, but they decided your website wasn't the one they wanted to click on. Um, and so there's, there's a lot more you can learn about your potential audience, not just your existing one, uh, but the one that you're, you're almost getting. Um, so uh, a lot of different uses for this. Um, uh, so in terms of the, the data itself, um, this is giving you uh, search terms and, and search queries that you can mine for insights. You can mine for you know, trends in words. If there's a, a particular term that your organization uses, takes pride in, you can see where that's showing up. You can see trends in it. Um, so a lot of information available there. Um, so I'm gonna stop on Google Search Console for now and we'll jump forward uh, to internal site search uh, and, uh, and learn a little bit about what that data looks like. So on-site search um, can be powered by a lot of different platforms in terms of your actual website's technology. Um, but uh, I'm gonna focus right now and, and a little bit of how we're gonna be talking about is gonna be in the context of Google Analytics. Uh, we do know that that is by far the most common analytics tool. Um, you know, we have found that uh, some 90 to 95% of nonprofits seem to be using Google Analytics. Um, so, uh, so this is probably gonna be the, the most obvious place for you to get at this data. Uh, but just to say there might be other places, your, your own website, your CMS, uh, and the search tools you use might also have search data that you can get at. Um, within Google Analytics, uh, first thing to note, how do you get it? How do you start capturing it? It is something that needs to be turned on. You are not collecting that data by default necessarily. Um, so that's something if you have never looked at it before, uh, haven't started accessing that, um, uh, you may need to work with your tech team to, to start collecting that site search data. Um, but the experience here is, is one, again, that's going to be pretty familiar to everyone. You're looking at a website, you want something, you don't see it right there on the homepage. Uh, so you go to that little box and you type in what it is that you're looking for. Um, once you do that, um, Google Analytics starts learning a lot. So it learns about um, you know, how many sessions, you know, how many people are actually searching. Um, it tells you a little bit about their behavior after they have completed a search, you know, how many of the results are they actually looking at? Um, are people giving up entirely and you know, jumping out of site search even before they've uh, clicked on anything because they didn't see what they were looking for? Are they changing their search? If they search for uh, US and don't see what they want, do they then search America? Um, so you can sort of see when people keep trying in order to find what they're looking for. Uh, and then behaviors after search, um, you know, how many, uh, how much time are they spending? So, so a lot of different uh, um, uh, types of insights that it automatically starts collecting once you turn it on. And then with that, again, uh, you know, I think these are the real goods, being able to see what are the individual terms that people are typing in. And you can get these sort of different engagement metrics on a term by term basis as well. Um, so this is very helpful. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's useful in a way similar to Google search data, where you are getting a sense of just what people want. Um, uh, but again, as I alluded to before, there's a slightly different user experience that sometimes applies to site search. Um, it's not necessarily, I wanted this, uh, I, I searched for this, 
it came up and I'm thrilled. Uh, sometimes it's, I have been looking for this and I couldn't find it uh, and I'm starting to get frustrated. So I'm gonna type it into site search. Um, so a slightly different uh, feel and mentality um, that users have when they're, uh, they're using this. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms, the specifics of this will change site to site. Um, uh, you know, how you encourage people to, uh, to, to navigate uh, your content. Um, so, but, but yeah, just some, some overall uh, takes there. All right, I'm gonna jump on to the next one, Google Trends. Um, if anyone isn't familiar with Google Trends, Google Trends is another tool um, that is provided by Google um, where Google Search Console is telling you about your website and how your website engages with the world and what people are searching for. Google Trends lets you know for the entire world, how are people searching for certain terms? Um, and, and it lets you type in things and sort of see how things are trending, again, by geography over time. Um, and, uh, and it lets you explore related interests. So it's a great research tool for this type of data, search data in particular. Um, the things that you learn from your Google Search Console, the things that you learn from Google Analytics are great to bring here. And you can see how they plug in with trends overall. It helps you find other queries that you might run. Um, and it helps you put things into context. It helps you compare things. You compare yourself against uh, global trends, but also compare um, individual word choices that you might be making. Um, uh, so a, a, a very helpful uh, research tool in that regard um, that deserves mention while you're working with search data. And then lastly, Twitter, Twitter monitoring and other social insights. Um, you know, because of the, the nature of you know, working with language, um, uh, working with user input language, uh, it's, it's hard to think about what you might learn from search without also wondering what's happening on social media. Um, and a lot of uh, social media platforms, but Twitter in particular, makes it easy to get at um, their content. So you can get at tweets very, very easily. And you can explore tweets, you can explore those conversations. Um, and so we can certainly talk more about um, uh, use cases for using search data when uh, doing uh, social monitoring and social listen listening. Um, but uh, but just, just to know that this is another platform where you can pull up people's human human language, you know, entered interests uh, and explore them for similar insights as to what you might look for in search data. What is going to be different here is uh, you don't have as tight a connection between the words they're using here and the words that they might be using to find your content, sort of, you know, page by page content. Um, it, it's a little bit more removed from your content than search data is. Um, so uh, uh, it, can, it can take more work at least uh, in order to uh, reunify those two. Um, so those are the four uh, universes of, uh, of data uh, that I, I would just want to you know, make sure everyone has in mind as they start thinking about using search data. Um, having data is one thing, using it is an entirely separate thing. Um, and a uh, uh, hat tip to all the analysts out there, um, it is not easy working with search data. That's one of the biggest reasons why um, it doesn't get uh, used is that when you open it up, it's incredibly dense. Um, you know, in the example I showed, which was a relatively small site, you still had 28,000 searches that resulted in that website's content showing up. Uh, and so that means 28,000 people typed something in, which means 28,000 rows of human entered text. Um, so it's important to, uh, those tools themselves, I should say first, um, are built for exploration. They are built so that you can, you know, click through, type things in, search for things, um, do a little browsing as well. Um, but they are kind of lightweight research tools. They're okay as reporting tools. Um, and so if you really have complex questions, deep questions, questions you want to answer quickly, you're going to have to start getting your data out of those platforms and doing your own analysis on them. Um, uh, you know, which sounds scary, but I just want to assure you that these things are also pretty close at hand. 
Excel is an extremely powerful data analysis tool. Uh, you can do a lot in Excel to extract, explore, unpack, and turn your data into visualizations that are ready for sharing around the rest of your team. Because uh, that's the important thing is your whole organization is probably not going to enjoy just sitting in Google Search Console all day. Um, but with a little time and a little elbow grease from an analyst, you can start turning that data into insights that are much more digestible. Um, so, uh, so important to, to think about that. And then, you know, once you have the data cleaned, organized the way you like, um, structure to answer the questions that you have. Um, uh, you know, I would say putting it into things like dashboards. Uh, you know, we use Data Studio often with our clients, um, and uh, and and having ways that make it easier for people to consume uh, is how you're going to start to get more value out of your search data. Um, to support the analysts. Um, and this advice is, is I think, for, for everyone and, and especially everyone else. Um, getting good insights out of your data depends on asking good questions of your data. And, uh, and so a few tips on that. Um, what and why questions are very thought provoking, but can sometimes be the hardest to answer. Um, and so if you're just getting started out with, uh, with search data, you're just, uh, you know, sort of trying to get a sense of what kinds of things you can know, try to ask yes, no questions. Um, is this word uh, commonly used? Is this word used more than its synonym? Um, can we get sort of simple yes, no questions about things that might help us? Um, I think that that can be a, a much easier way, especially if, if you're at an organization that does not have an analyst um, and you're just sort of bringing uh, you know, somebody who's not really as experienced in data analysis, um, this is a good way and it, and it makes it easier to get started using the data. That being said, be very clear about the decision that you're trying to make based on the answer to your question. Um, uh, again, open-ended questions, I, I encourage. I think they can be very thought-provoking. Thought, thought but when you have an action that your organization might take based on the result, it can really help with focus in exploring this data. Um, it can also help in, uh, in deciding how confident uh, that you are. So yeah, it seems like this term is better. OK, well, we're going to change the name of our organization based on that. Well, hey, Hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't think I don't, I'm not quite that confident about it. Um, so being clear about what you're going to do based on the results can change what you learn and how you want to use the data that you have access to. Um, and then lastly, trying to pose your question in terms of data that your analyst has available. Again, this is a big part of our work is helping organizations just get a handle on what do they have. Um, and to the extent that you can sort of enter that world with them and get a sense of what things, what tools they actually have to answer questions. Um, uh, you know, if you can ask your question in that context and sort of say, I want to know based on the frequency of this term, as opposed to, I want to know, uh, you know, just what impact we've had um, overall. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you ask questions about just starting with the impact of somebody who only has access to, um, you know, on-site, uh, you know, uh, consumption, uh, it's a lot harder to connect those dots. And so trying to meet in the middle between the analyst and the, the stakeholders uh, can, can make those conversations a lot more productive. Um, and a big asterisk there, again, I do not wanna discourage those big open questions. I think those big open questions are critical uh, to having a healthy data culture. Um, uh, and also can help you lead to new capabilities. Um, but even as you're on your way towards that, you know, being able to collect new data, use it, um, being able to make use of what you have today. Uh, I think these are some tips to support that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from here. We've you know got some examples, and we'll have the deck afterwards. Uh, but you know, examples of the types of questions you might ask uh, and what you might do with them after the fact. Okay, I'm gonna jump forward, and I actually think we're doing. Yeah, we're doing quite well on time. Um, so we're gonna put up a poll, uh, another poll just to get a sense from the group, how, what, what do we wanna do now? Um, do we want to keep rolling with the deck? Uh, we have a couple uh, potential use cases that we could talk through. Um, or if we're, you know, if everyone's got questions bottled up, we can jump straight into Q&A right now uh, and maybe uh, switch back to the content later.
Okay, all right. It looks like uh, we're, we're hungry for more content. So that's great. I think very clear answer there. Um, okay, so we have talked through what is search data, why is it useful, why is it important. We've talked through a few of the tools, the places where you can get at your search data. We touched very briefly on what it takes to analyze it uh, and how uh, um, you know uh, staff and stakeholders can uh, can help ask good questions. Um, so what we're going to jump forward through now are a couple thought examples. Um, so sort of hypothetical ways in which you might use search data. Um, one that uh, you know has certainly come up for us and that we've done work on uh, is evaluating the value of your brand. Um, so how can you find audiences that are using your brand terms when searching for content? And, and what can you learn from how frequently they do that? Uh, and again, uh, brand is a you know, pretty big term and it can re uh, represent a lot of things. So the brand could be your entire organization, but the brand might also be certain programs or initiatives uh, or campaigns that you're running uh, within the organization. Um, or it could be things like a product. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations have, uh, and again, product is a big term, but it could be the brand of your ad annual gala, uh, or it could be the brand of a certain resource that you publish once a year. Um, and then last but certainly not least are the people of your organizations, your experts, um, your, uh, you know, any, any sort of celebrities, uh, you know, your board uh, members who, who might be important boosters of, of your organization. Being able to Look for those terms in your data can give you a sense of how much lift your organization is getting from them. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that, uh, you know, it can be very useful just internally, uh, you know, from a messaging perspective, um, being able to show the effect of uh, brand work that you have done. Um, but then I also think it, it tells you a lot um, about audiences and sort of what those different audiences want because people who are using your brand terms have more affinity you know they are not just looking for you know uh, the topic that you cover as somebody who doesn't care who you are they just want to know about the topic um, these are people who want to know about that topic and know that they want to know your opinion um, so these are really some some loyal audiences uh, and so being able to sort of see how their patterns and, and what content the people who search for your brand are consuming. Um, and it can be very, very informative. Um, it can also show you as you look at brand, you know, across your whole website and, uh, and brand traffic um, uh, across your whole website. Um, where is your brand having the most impact and what parts of your content might actually need more help? You might need to focus more on brand because uh, the brand isn't actually saturating in the community that's looking for uh, educational materials. Uh, your brand is really good on uh, healthcare, uh, but, uh, but you could actually do more to, to help the education market uh, recognize your brand because you do good work on education. Um, so I think these are just some, uh, some examples of the types of questions you might ask when doing brand analysis. Um, putting it into practice. Um, so first things first, you have to have good definitions of your brand. Um, you know, being able to map your brand to the actual terms and phrases that people are going to use uh, is, is, is necessary and, and sometimes fraught um, uh, because sometimes it's not always clear. Is this term a brand term or is this just an English language word um, that, uh, that you know, does or does, it may or may not have to do with your brand? Um, so th there might be some uh, internal consensus building that you have to do before you're ready to even do this analysis. Um, actually exploring those brand terms can and be very quick um, at a base level. Just jump into the Google search console and type in the name of your organization and voila, you've got your first insight. Uh, how much of your search traffic comes from uh, people using the brand name. Um, it, it can get more complicated from there very quickly um, as you start looking to just subsets of your content. Um, uh, that's the kind of thing where you might want to start pulling the data offline to do custom analysis. Um, but why should you do that? Uh, you know, some of the things we described, being able to elevate the brand, figuring out what audiences you might need to work harder on to elevate, elevate the brand with, um, and otherwise as, as an input to your brand strategy. If you're starting a brand project, absolutely do this. I think this is critical information for any brand strategy. 
Um, and then uh, again, you know, how else might you use the results from this? Having those insights uh, that you can report up to leadership uh, to help give them clarity and confidence over, yes, our brand is, is working, our brand is making a difference. Um, uh, you know, I think you'll have to think through what the expectations there are in terms of how you present uh, the results of, uh, of brand, uh, brand research in your search data. Um, uh, I think there's a there's a lot of art uh, in that, you know, being able to to sort of think through what those expectations were, but you know, in the absence of data, this might be the first time to start, you know, drawing lines in the sand, having benchmarks, uh, and being able to show uh, what the value and the history of that value of your brand was. I think the next one I want to talk about um, is being able to understand how well your content is serving audience needs. Um, and so this is thinking a little bit more about how to tie search to engagement. Um, and, uh, and this is a, 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 an admittedly tough one, um, but uh, the idea here is we wanna be able to get a sense on a term by term basis, how do words match up with audiences that are coming to the site and then engaging well? Um, and uh, a, a lot of there's a lot of details in, into that type of analysis. Um, uh, but what it takes to put it into practice is first developing the sets of high and low quality terms based on engagement. Um, and so that's going to mean having good definitions of engagement. Um, I, sh I should have put a, a bullet above there. Um, you need to be able to evaluate and measure engagement on your site first and foremost, um, uh, before you know, this, this really becomes possible. You can do it at a very base level with just Google search data. You can see term by term, are people clicking on our website when they see the result? Um, that type of search analysis is, is a good first step and can be done uh, much more simply. Um, but if you wanna start connecting it to things, concepts like impact, you're gonna have to start bringing together from sort of throughout that user journey. Um, and, uh, and so, so yeah, so I think that's um, uh, one of the steps that you have to take there. Once you've done this though, I think the results of this type of analysis uh, can be very, very powerful in terms of informing your editorial team, giving your editorial team direct input on these are words that people are using, these are words that people aren't using. Um, and then also when, when people search for us with these words, um, they are taking the next steps. It leads them to content um, that helps us accomplish the mission versus, you know, you may have popular words that are bringing people to the site, um, but those people don't stick around or, or those people are coming to content on your site that actually isn't as, as mission critical. Um, you might have uh, pages on your site that are, are, are very interesting and informative, uh, but perhaps there was just the, the description of your, uh, you know, your, your, a company picnic uh, last summer that's got great pictures. Uh, is it really mission aligned? Uh, you know, it, it, there's some good hard questions uh, about content strategy uh, and then about the editorial process of creating content that helps you with the, the satisfying terms, gets you more term A traffic, uh, and then either reduces or redirects term B traffic uh, to content that's gonna satisfy those people more. Uh, and then being able to monitor engagement based on, on those changes as a sort of real-time feedback for your content team, your editorial team, your marketing and promotions teams, um, and being able to, to let them see what the, the, the impact of, uh, of you know, sort of SEO type work uh, uh, might be, or, or even you know, taking it into, into you know, the social media email uh, outreach. Um, yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's sort of another use case, uh, being able to use search data in this content and content production uh, context. Um, last but certainly not least, um, you know, we talked before about the relationship between search and search data uh, and social media, um, both being places where people are really giving you very direct and candid uh, insights and feedback uh, into what they like, what they don't like. Um, there are some great opportunities to use search as a way to learn about the language that your audience uses so that, um, sort of a, as I alluded to in the last use case, um, so that you can change the way you conduct your outreach. Um, uh, I think, again, from an editorial perspective, you can use it directly. You can just say, hey, social media team, 
uh, here's a report on you know what we've learned about the use of key terms in our you know in our lexicon um, and uh, and these are things that we want you to know and terms that we want you to start using more terms that we found nobody uses so let's maybe downplay those even if it's in the report um, but I think the the real power of this comes when you start introducing new social listening tools um, so with social listening tools you can again take those terms that you found to be particularly on brand or particularly uh, engaging for your audiences and you can start looking listening out on social media for communities where those conversations are already happening uh, perhaps and very likely without you um, so it's, it's a way that you can discover uh, individual users or whole communities um, where where you should be and and, and perhaps aren't um, and so as you have that going on you can do this sort of uh, strategically and sort of say okay comms team let's uh, you know we're going to Reddit. Um, there's a great community that we found by searching for these terms. Uh, and, uh, and that's just a place that we should start generally uh, participating. Uh, but you can even get really, really tactical with this. Uh, so you could have real time alerts uh, that say, okay, um, whenever uh, we're talking about uh, defense policy in Afghanistan um, and somebody with more than uh, a thousand uh, followers mentions any of these individuals, um, that's something that our scholar on defense in Afghanistan needs to know about um, because uh, you know, they can then jump onto Twitter right away and say, oh, hey, Colonel so-and-so, we've done a report on what you just said about Afghanistan and here's our best insights. And they can start a conversation and sort of have that real-time social engagement. Um, in order to do that, and in order to do that at scale, it really helps to have confidence in your your lexicon and uh, and what you've learned about your lexicon uh, and the ability to uh, to sort of bring that back as a, as a feed in. Um, so I think those are three examples I wanted to talk about. There are so many more. Uh, if you're doing any work on taxonomy, I think that's an obvious one. Um, here are your audience's own words uh, that you can use to inform what your organizational taxonomy should be. Um, so that's a really clear one. Um, another one that I didn't go into detail here, uh, but uh, you know, I also uh, have no monopoly on this one, but it's the idea of using your search data to inform your SEO strategy and inform uh, your search engine marketing strategy. Um, and so you could you know, set up AdWords campaigns based on what you learn from your search data. Um, these are, you know, that's a much more traditional use of this search data, um, whereas here we're sort of focusing on uh, more unusual and sort of edge cases, uh, but lots of, lots of ways um, in which you could do that. Um, yeah, so those were the case, uh, you know, sort of use cases I wanted to walk through. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna go into Q&A um, before I do, and we'll encourage this again at the end, uh, but four things you should do today. Uh, whether you already have, well, if you already have access, I encourage you to go into Google Analytics, navigate your way to the site search reports. It's under the behavior tab in Google Analytics. Uh, and, uh, and in Google Search Console, um, uh, go, you know, go to the website, log in to the Google Search Console website. Again, that's Google's own dashboard um, that they have set up. Uh, navigate your way to that data. Make sure you have access to it. If you do have access to those, just give each of them five minutes. Just poke around uh, if you've never done it before. Uh, I think you can learn so much so quickly um, about what's possible and you can start getting answers. Um, uh, but then otherwise, if you don't have access to either, spend those five minutes instead you know, trying to find the person at your organization who can help you get access. Um, it, there is so much data available to you and uh, access and awareness are the biggest blockers uh, at most organizations. So, uh, so do that favor uh, for yourself uh, and for me. It makes me happy when people get at this data. Um, uh, and then I would say the last step here is, is schedule a meeting with somebody on your team. Uh, where you're just going to sit down together and just look at this data together. Um, just give it 
you know, 15, 30 minutes. Um, uh, again, it, the data only helps your organization when you use it. And, uh, and just putting that, uh, that time pressure, if you can get it on your calendar, then it's gonna happen. Um, uh, and you can know that. It's, it's easy to put this off as a resource indefinitely. Um, um, you can get by without it, um, but it can do tremendous things for your organization if you start using it. And I think these first steps uh, will uh, at least get you on the road. Um, so that is, got some other advice that we can talk about, you know, the sort of a, a summary of what we just described. Um, but uh, I think that otherwise is the end of the content. Uh, so I'd love to jump into questions and answers. Um, I know our, our team has been looking at the, you know, things that you guys have been typing into chat the whole time. So uh, we're going to have Lisa from our team um, uh, be, be your voice. Uh, so Lisa, do you want to uh, let me know what, uh, what we've been hearing? Yes, we've gotten a few really good questions in the chat. I've been really excited to see. Um, one of them, one of the first things that got pointed out was that your screenshots that you used in your presentation, uh, GC, GSC, uh, looks a little different in our screenshots than it did for the user. So what's that about? That is interesting. Uh, I, I, I'd be very curious to, to talk to those. Um, so GSC. Sounds like that, that, that person was using an integrated search console with GA. Ah, ah. yes, 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 the yes. Okay. Screen. Thank you. Thank you. That is a great call out. Yes. Google Analytics has a Google Search Console integration. It was developed, oh it was developed at a point where the relationship between Google Search data and Google Analytics data was much tighter than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a few years ago now. Um, Google stopped reporting individual terms and keywords to Google Analytics um, for privacy reasons. So Google Analytics lost about 90% or more uh, of the individual term and query and, and keyword data. Um, so that connection is still there. It's a little bit vestigial. Um, I, I don't love it personally, and I rarely encourage it. Um, uh, do not look for your Google search keyword data in Google Analytics. It will disappoint you and, uh, and perhaps even mislead you. Go directly to Google Search Console. Um, Google Search Console still gives you all of the terms, but there they've taken steps to make it harder for you to say, oh, this specific word is what my Aunt Betsy typed in, um, uh, in, in ways that could violate individual users' privacy. Um, and so they've done it to, to protect the public, um, but it makes it harder uh, on, on, on us analysts uh, to sort of get at the data, which is now in these two different places. Uh, and we have to do more work to, to get those insights out of it. Gotcha. Um, so yes, yes, that's probably the biggest difference. I will also say of Google Search Console, um, there's a lot in there. Um, I'm going from memory right now, but I think when you get in, you want to click on the performance tab on the left. Um, and that's where you'll start to see familiar screenshots uh, to the ones I took. Cool, very helpful. Yes. Uh, we also had a question of how often would you check terms on Google Trends? Uh, are they changing like, daily, weekly? Um, no, I mean, right now, uh, I would say a daily. Um, you know, it's gonna it, it's gonna depend entirely term by term uh, and what's going on in the world. Um, but you will find some incredibly wild swings uh, in there uh, when things hit the news cycle. Um, if you're working on something and you're curious about terms um, that are you know on the front page of uh, any major news outlet, uh, I would I would go in there on a pretty regular basis uh, to get a sense of, of trends. Um, uh, I wish I, I brought it in, but uh, you know, we, we did a sort of fun analysis on uh, coronavirus related terms, uh, things like shelter in place, um, uh, things like uh, you know, uh, case counts for coronavirus, um, and things that you might think people are searching for because they are sheltering in place, things like uh, food delivery, and pe people wondering what to do with their money. Um, and you can see how you know, uh, interest in the virus itself spiked early on and has been gradually waning as people, okay, we get it, we're in a crisis. Uh, whereas the, the sort of more personal need you know, how am I going to take care of myself? What am I going to do with my money? Uh, how do I take care of my kids? Interest in that 
is sustaining and even growing in some cases. Um, and so I think there's a lot to be learned um, by, uh, by exploring um, uh, Google Trends uh, about what's going on in your audience's world. Another good question, what are some listening tools that they could use? Um, listening tools, yes. Uh, and I've got, uh, I have a blog post about this. Um, I don't remember if we had a, already planned to put it in our follow-up note, but uh, uh, Lisa and Andrea, let, let's make sure we get it in there. Um, if you search uh, social media listening tools, you're going to get list hundreds. There are hundreds of tools out there. Um, uh, some of them are very, very expensive. Um, a lot of them are going to have more power than your average non-profiteer is going to have the time and attention to take advantage of. Um, so I would say um, starting simple is good. Um, I know that Google Sheets in particular has a plugin called Twitter Archiver. It's free. Um, and uh, you can go in there and you can configure a certain term that you want to search. You can set it to automatically refresh. Um, so I think that one, if, you know, for Twitter data in particular, is a really good starting place. Um, um, in terms of a more, you know, that's, that's good, especially if you have, you know, I, I've got very focused question I want to ask and I want to monitor it in just this way and I want to do things with it afterwards. Um, but a lot of tools that you already have, things like TweetDeck, um, uh, I think uh, Hootsuite itself also has um, um, social listening tools. So I would say first look at the tools that you already have and already use. Um, a lot of them will have some even lightweight social listening capabilities. Uh, beyond that, uh, we've got a blog post uh, that we'll, we'll pass around afterwards. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there's, there, yeah, it's, there, there's, a, there's a lot of options there. Another one is uh, for GA site search, what's an okay range for a percentage of search exits? Of search exits, hmm. I, I would hesitate to answer without actually looking at the site, looking at the search and sort of thinking about the, the user experience of your site search implementation specifically. Um, I, a little bit going on, on memory here, I think I often see things in the range of 10 to 40 percent. Um, so that's a pretty big range. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, what tool you're using to manage your site search. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, specifics about the user experience uh, of your site and the type of content that you have as well. Um, you know, if you're a site with a lot of content on a narrow set of topics um, where you should expect people to find exactly what they're looking for, um, then I would expect your, your exits to be a bit lower. Um, but if you're an organization that has an incredibly broad range of things that you're going to talk on, maybe only a little bit of, of content uh, in each of those categories, um, you should expect to have a higher exit rate um, because people might come in looking for something that, oh, well, I guess they're not, they're not quite the right fit here. Um, uh, that's also going to change based on um, your marketing and outreach strategy. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, that's an engagement metric. Um, other engagement metrics include things like bounce rate, time on site. Um, a lot of people get nervous when they see those uh, metrics turn bad, um, but that's just because you just did a big blast and a whole bunch of people who've never heard of you before just came to your site for the first time these are people who you should expect to be less, less engaged. Um, and so, so having those bad, um, bad lower um, uh, engagement rates um, is, is more a sign of your activity uh, as much as it is the value and quality of your content um, or, or even of your outreach. Um, so how, how's that as a, <laughs> it depends answer? I think you, you can't couch that one really well. Uh, another one, does Google Search Console provide insight into the not provided terms? Uh, yes, yes. So that is, um, that's the piece that I mentioned before. Um, so a million people go into Google Search and they type something in. Google Search Console is going to give you the text that they typed in for 
I don't know exactly what percent, but a very, very high percentage uh, of those people. Um, Google has that data. They are letting you search that data. Um, they broke the connection between that data and Google Analytics. So in Google Analytics, you know, if this many people searched and then maybe 90% of that data is in Google Search Console, I would say about one, five, maybe 10% of that data is in Google Analytics. So it's gonna give you a huge chunk, maybe like 80% of the data is lost uh, in that step. So Google Search Console will give you a lot of information that shows it was not provided in GA. Uh, kind of a follow-up to an earlier question. What about the query data that we can see in Google Ads? Uh, like most nonprofits, this is the instance I'm giving here, like most nonprofits, we've been using the Google Grants for ads and have a variety of ad terms. There is a search keywords in there. Um, okay, yes. Uh, that one might bear a little bit longer. I know we're, we're just coming up on time now. Yeah. Um, so that might be a, a, a better one to, to talk about offline. Um, yeah. But those, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, Google search data from GSC and, and, um, and your site search are gonna be a place where you research and come up with the terms that mm -hmm. you'll want to use to configure um, your Google grant um, AdWords setup. Um, so that'll be a, a place where you where you bring your insights and then you change the, the keywords that you're using to post those ads. Uh, and so you can start targeting more specifically just people who are using this term that we do really well with, or just people who are using this term that we don't really have, we only have one piece of content for it, but we wanna make sure everyone finds it. Um, and so, so I think it can guide your search engine marketing, your AdWords um, strategy uh, and, and really fine tune sort of ways. And, and those fields um, uh, would, would be the ones where you do that. Thanks for grabbing that one. That, that was our last question. Yeah. All right, very good. Well, thank you everyone uh, for, for joining and uh, for everyone who stayed all the way through. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, you know, this is uh, the first in a, in a series that uh, you know, we, we plan to be doing um, over the coming months, I, I think especially given, given the way the world has changed on, on all of us. Um, so we will be uh, having a, a follow-up note uh, coming out. Um, and, uh, and I do want to uh, apologize for, for anyone who got stuck at the beginning. Um, uh, we had a, a little bit of a, a delay in getting the, the webinar started. Um, so, uh, so thanks for, for those of you who stuck through it. Uh, we'll have a survey coming out. Uh, we'll have a follow-up email with uh, resources um, that are going to help guide us forward. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. We're going to sign off.